And then I just want to again affirm, uh, I did it in the first service, Atlanta School of Ministry. I don't know if this is the standard uh, presentation that they bring to every church. Uh, when I was with Teen Challenge, we had some standard presentations, but we also mixed them up. And uh, sometimes we also, uh, those of us that were leading, went in a different direction. And we, we'd be like, well, we've been practicing this, and we feel like we need to do this at this church at this time. But I have to tell you, it was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. They did an illustration from the, the first little stool sitting here on stage to the spoken word that illustrates what we're going to talk about today, which is body life, how we can be transformed by the Holy Spirit. And basically, my primary point uh, as we're talking about this is that I'm not seeing a lot of transformation in the church world today. But a secondary point that perhaps I didn't uh, uh, explain well during the morning service is I am seeing a remnant of people, young and old, who are hungry for a transformation of the church and of the body of Christ. We're living in a world where we're looking for solutions. We're looking at the, the election cycle this year, and some of us are going, who are we going to vote for? Because we're looking at the two candidates and we're not so sure. And I hear members of the church trying to convince themselves, this is why this one's the better choice. And we're looking for solutions to the, the, the chaos in the world and, and to the economic situation, which is still not as great, even though it's turned around as we think it is. It's very unstable right now. And the church world as a whole, and especially here in the United States, we seem to be looking for an earthly solution. Or we seem to be looking for the return of Jesus. And we just want to escape all of this. And the problem is the church. We are not being transformed. We are not being salt and light. The problem is not the White House. The problem is not Obama. The problem is not Hillary and Donald. The problem is the church. I didn't share this this morning, but some of us are seeking revival. But let me tell you something. Revival without transformation of the heart will destroy a nation. And what do I mean about, by that? You go to the Old Testament, and you see the reign of King Josiah, and Josiah comes on the scene, and Josiah is hungry for God, and Josiah says, tear down the idols. Nation, you got to turn back to God, and the nation says, we will. And during the reign of jo Josiah, there's great revival, there's great impact in the nation. Things turn around, but at the same time, during the reign of King Josiah, there's a prophet named Jeremiah that begins to speak out, and he begins to say, God is going to destroy this nation parallel at the same time. And if you really study the history of that revival as it's presented in the, in the Old Testament, you see that the king had a change of heart, but the people didn't. And as soon as King Josiah passed off the scene, the people went back to what they were doing. They, they, they were following King Josiah and following his direction, but they weren't following the direction of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. In their day, the Holy Spirit didn't live inside of them. The, the God dwelt in, 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 in the midst of the tabernacle and the temple for the people of God, but God still spoke to them. And so I want to tell you, even if we get a president who's a Christian, even if... Trump or Hillary get in office, and surprise, 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 God really turns their heart toward him. If the people don't follow, we'll perish. And so it's very important we understand what it means to live in this body that we inhabit. And I would say beyond inhabit, this body is us. This is, you know, I look at Pastor Pete I don't confuse him and, and Deb. I mean, I know they're one, his, his a married couple, but if I see Deb, I don't say, oh, there goes Pastor Pete, because they look very different. One of them looks better than the other, and it's not you I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, but I don't confuse them. That's how we present ourselves 
to the world around us that, that we're a part of is we are a, a living body, a being. And Jesus said in Galatians 2.20, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. So Paul is saying this, but he's telling us a revelation from God. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been, uh, I, I shared with the, the congregation this morning, I've been at work on this passage for about three years. I'm maybe, I maybe not, depends on what happens. I'm, I'm trying to write a book that kind of came out of this passage. And this is a passage I memorized early in my Christian walk. In fact, those of you that may be uh, in your Christian walk, when you first got saved, somebody handed you a box of Navigator cards, and you kind of tore the little cards, and you put them in your packet. This is like one of the first two verses you memorize in that, that pack of cards. And so I'm pretty familiar with this verse, and a few years ago I was reading through Galatians, and I just got to that phrase, the life I now live in the body. And I thought, what does that mean? What does that really mean? You know how the Holy Spirit sometimes just stops you and you're, you're, you're looking at something you've read hundreds of times, but you go, what does that mean? And I've come to the conclusion that for the most part, the church, at least the evangelical church, and the Pentecostal church does not have a good theology of the body. So we're going to talk about theology today. And for those of you that don't like that word that say, well, I just read the Bible. You're getting theology from reading the Bible and your understanding of the Bible. And theology is, is, is it's, it's not the fundamentals, it's not the essentials. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, those are part of our theology, but it's... It, uh, we have pastors today that will try to convince you by using what they call theology to say, well, the Bible really isn't 100% true. You can't trust in it. It's not reliable. Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. He didn't really uh, raise from the dead. And, and they're denying the essential truths of the faith, which all Christians, if you look at the essential truths of the faith, there's really five or six things that you can quickly identify, and if somebody doesn't believe it, nope, that's not, they're not a Christian. Jehovah's Witness comes to my door, I start going through the essential truths with them, you, you don't believe in the Trinity? You don't believe that Jesus is eternal, was God for all time, even before he came to earth? You don't believe that, oh, you're not, a, you're not really a Christian. Mormon comes to my door, you don't believe, oh, so we're not talking about, and, and as Pentecostals, we, we have a few more than, but I'm saying all Christians have about five. You can count them on your hand. Sometimes you'll, you'll see people and they'll say, well, there's six, but, but pretty fundamental. And we, and we have some things as Pentecostals we believe that are fundamental, but there's theology. And theology is, is simply as we're looking at the scriptures, as we're seeing what the scriptures say, uh, we, we look at the scriptures, that's really a biblical theology. Uh, what's the Bible say about this? So w w what's, what's John's theology as he's looking at Jesus? What's Pauline theology? And, and, and you've heard of systematic theology. What, what does God say about angels? And what does God say about himself? And, and you look at all of those things, and uh, we, we, we build doctrines based on those. We have beliefs based on those. We're, we're, we're really looking... And, and it's not really the study of God, which is what theology means, the phrase, but it's more we're, we're looking in the culture in our time, and it's the study of the God's eye view, how God sees things. And there are things in theology that, I mean, they're just set in stone. They're just for all time. But there's other things when, when you really study and look at theology and look at different types of theology. So, you, so for instance, I'm only sharing a, a brief window into a theology of the body, uh, but there's things you look at and you study, and you begin to look at them in your cultural context. And so some of those get dated. So, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of theology, so I read a lot of theology books. And um, 
for those of you that had a history uh, has has reformed and came from a reformed background, I really love reformed theology, though that, though I don't agree with all of it. Uh, but I love it because they, one of the things they do is they're striving for a holistic view. How does this apply to every area of life? And they have a great understanding of the sovereignty of God. But you study some of them, and some of them were slave owners, uh, part of the Confederacy. Uh, some of the great theologians you'll hear of, they'll say some things, and they're really dated. You kind of look at it and go, whoa, that's not scriptural at all. So you kind of have to, to look at theology in light of revelation that God's given, that's continuing, that's progressive, but always back to the word that isn't continuing or progressive. It's living and active, and there's a difference. So we need a theology of the body. What does it mean, the life I now live in the body? Let me ask you this question. What is a human body? Here's some of the answers the world will tell you. Here's some of the answers great philosophers have told us. One is it's a prison. We want to escape this body, so we want to escape and go be with Jesus. And we will escape this body one day. When I put somebody into the ground at a funeral when I was pastoring, and I knew they were a believer, I would say they're not there. But don't think that that's all it means, that now they're spirits with Jesus, because there's an, actually an amputation that happens when they're separated during that time from their body. And the Bible makes it clear that one day Jesus will return, and just like he rose up in bodily form, he will return in bodily form, and the dead in Christ will rise, and their bodies will be transformed. So we will worship God physically, interacting with Jesus. We will be able to eat food. Jesus ate food after he rose from the grave. We will still be able to touch things, but it will be in a way that we've never known because our body will be transformed. So we're not a prison. That's what a lot of uh, Christian, uh, not Christians, uh, people today will say, uh, I'm not a part of any faith. I'm into spirituality. And some of these, you see some of these celebrities and they say, I'm spiritual. And they do things in the body that you kind of look. And that's an ancient heresy. That's separating the body and the spirit and the mind. And I want to tell you that even though God tells us that these things have different functions, they're part of a whole. And so when they separate that, they're saying the body is something you discard. It's a prison. And Christians do that today. I shared it in, in first service that uh, I do, you know, I'm, I, I work with the homeless. My wife works with the homeless. We spent a lot of years, even when we were in ministry, working with the homeless and working with uh, people with drug addictions and working with people with alcohol problems. And one of the things that I've heard over and over again from some of them that I truly believe are believers because of things they say and things they do, but in other aspects they're not living it is, well, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I'm like, that's not what Paul meant when he said that. He didn't mean that you could go sin because your flesh is weak. He meant that when you sin because your flesh is weak, that there's hope. But he didn't give you a justification to go sin and say, well, I had a guy sitting across from my desk the other day, and he's, he's been saying to me over and over again, you know, God really sent you. You called me at just the right time. He's been homeless for almost a year. You're my ram in the bush, he says. And so I was challenging him on something to take some responsibility, and he says, well, my spiritual man is strong, but I'm just a man of flesh. And it's like, and that's why you're in the problems you're in. Now, I'm not saying every homeless individual deserves to be there, and it's because of the, the, it's their fault that they're there. But I'm saying this gentleman needs a wake-up call. And then others say the body's a machine. Some, like uh, uh, an atheist philosopher, uh, Daniel Dennett, he wrote a book, and he calls our body intuition pumps. Basically, just the way things are, are pumping in our body and stuff, it makes us conscious. It makes us beings. It, it emerges somehow out of this inanimate ooze. 
And others say, well, it's more than that. There's a ghost in there. There's something spiritual. The ghost in the machine, you've heard that phrase. But this is still a machine that we're going to escape one day and discard. And then others think it's a project. All I have to do is say the words Caitlyn Jenner, and most of you can tell what a project is. <laughs> I can reshape my body to who I think I am. The world's views are that, but the biblical view is quite different. The human body is good. God made it good. God made it perfect. But we sinned. The body fell. The spiritual part of us instantly, there was instant death. Now, we're eternal, so we tend to think of spirit as eternal, but there, the, that, that idea of death means separation from God instantly. The physical body began to decay, and the minds and the emotion and the will became confused and blinded and distorted in their thinking. So it's fallen, but the body was created good. So we have to understand when we say we're in Christ. Now, this body that, that, that Christ is saying, this is what you interact with the world with. There's a way you need to live, Paul's telling us, that's in line with Christian belief and Christian teaching. But yes, your body is frail. I shared this morning, I broke my back about 10 years ago, and every morning I know my body's frail. I have to kind of figure out, depending on how my back went the night before I sleep on a wedge, for three years after I did it, I actually had to sleep in a recliner, my wife, and I, and I didn't like that because, you know, I'm married and I want to be next to my wife. So we actually put the recliner next to the bed so I could reach out and grab her hand at night. And then we finally, my mom bought, us this, bought me this wedge, and I slip on this we sleep on this wedge, but sometimes, you know, I kind of slide down the wedge, and, and I wake up, and I'm like, I am not going to be able to move this morning. And so I figured out I can, like, hike my leg over the edge of the bed, and with my leg, I can pull my body up. And then I sit there for a little while and kind of let the pain ebb, and then I can get up, and then I'm good to go. I might have to take some Advil, and uh, it's fallen. But even with that limitation, Christ is made perfect in my weakness, his strength. He manifests something in there. So a God's eye view of the human body and human being is simply this. We're an organized whole. We were originally animated by God. Every one of us that is born on this planet still has the seed of that first breath that God blew into Adam. That's, that's what we call life. But the whole seed isn't there because there was also a separation. And when God blew into Adam, there was an empowering of the Holy Spirit that we lost. You can see in Genesis 2-7 and 2 Corinthians 3-18 this idea that we are in need of reanimation. Here's where I'm going. We need a good theology of the body if we're going to see a transformation of the church. I shared an example this morning of this idea of living with the body because I knew it would be relevant to many of us in this congregation and to our generation uh, and to the younger generation. And somebody talked to me between service and they said, I thought you were going after me <laughs> when you started because I was talking about tattoos. In my generation, you saw very few of them. In the older generation over me, I can remember a friend of my dad's that was in the Navy, and he had tattoos down both arms, and he's the only person I knew that had them for years until I saw a few others. So it was like you lived on the wild side. You know, you were a biker, or you'd been a sailor or something. And then it gradually, in my generation, there were a few of them, you know, and, but a lot of times you'd see tattoos, and it was like that was part of their past. Uh, you didn't see Christians going out and getting a lot of tattoos. And now it's pretty much a part of our culture. And I know people that get tattooed and they say they're tat you know, getting tattooed. Uh, they're getting a cross and they're getting tattooed for Christ. I have friends that have a whole sleeve and it's like their life story. And 
we have some of the older generation that's still condemning that and looking at that and they'll give you scriptures and we have some of the younger generation that's you know I, I, I actually have read a theology of tattooing talking about theology where it shows tattooing has a witness in the historical church in different cultures and I shared with the person this morning I said I think it's in the Psalms but it's actually I reflected on it later it's in Isaiah but Jesus says, it says in the scripture, and if you were to read it in the original language, a lot of times it's, it's, in, in, it's, it's said, I've written you on the palm of my hands, or I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. But if you look at the word, the word literally means I've made a picture of you on the palm of my hands. I've tattooed you. Your name, your face is tattooed on the palm of his, of his hands. And, and, and so I use this as an example because it's very contemporary. You know, we have pastoral staff that have tattoos. And there are probably people in our church that look at that sometimes and go, wow, his past, Pastor Pete, was really wild. <laughs> the person that shared with me this morning still continues to get tattoos. And this person said, I've had people come up and say, that's not godly. But see, a good theology of the body doesn't condemn what somebody else has done, doesn't condemn what they eat or drink. Another illustration I gave is a little wine with dinner nowadays. Pretty common, even in the church, even in Pentecostal holiness movements that used to condemn alcohol blanket statement. I mean, it blew me away. My son-in-law, my daughter, was here for the morning service. It's probably the first Pentecostal service she's been in a long time because my son-in-law is a Lutheran pastor, Missouri Synod, and so my daughter converted to Lutheranism. And, uh, and I have a good respect for their theology of the body, by the way, if you really understand it. Don't have an agreement with everything with them, but they are believers. I'm a believer, and, but, they, but they drink. And it just blew me away when my son-in-law went to a pastoral retreat when I first kind of started getting to know them. And they had open bar at the pastor's com conference. And I'm like, that would not happen. And in a, some, I mean, somebody might sneak to the bar afterwards. Somebody might have it in their hotel room. But there is not going to be an open bar at an Assemblies of God conference. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, we, we had maybe one beer and you're drinking and nobody's drunk and... I'm like, okay, Josh, but just so you know, that's hard for me to get my head around. Um, but it's not what we eat or drink. It's the intent. It's why we're doing it. It's the reason we're getting the tattoo. It's the purpose. Are we trying to be countercultural and actually being just like everybody else in our generation? I shared this morning, I, you know, I love looking at tattoos. I've, I've actually thought about getting one. I know uh, in Lansing there's Ministry Inc., you know, and they ink for, for Jesus, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, I mean, they do some great tattoos. I have friends that are, are young men that are Christians, and they play in bands, and they have tattoos. Uh, but, I, you know, and there's times I've thought kind of, Virginia, what would you think if I come home with a tattoo? <laughs> She's like, it's your body. I don't care what you do. <laughs> I just maybe don't want to look at it. <laughs> uh, but then I think, okay, my role in, in life, and not just here, but I am an elder here. I am a former pastor. I am on the board here. How, uh, will, will that cause people to stumble? How does that represent us as a church? Even in the community, uh, I have friends that are Christians that have lots of tattoos, but for me, for what God's called me to do, how will that impact uh, the people around me? And for me, I start looking at that, and then I look at my fin finances, and I think, is that bringing glory to God? Is that a good stewardship of my money? For me, it isn't. And so to do that would not be right. But I don't look at Pastor Pete, and I said to everybody this morning, because I kept pointing to Pastor Pete, because he's right on the front row, and I can use him as an example, but I could, like, I could go around, because I look, I notice tattoos, too. Uh, but I, I, I'm not saying for you guys to now go, 
Oh, look at Pastor Pete's tattoo. This is for you personally. How are you going to live in the body of Christ? And how are you going to be accountable within this larger body of Christ? And how are you going to live in your body? But you may hold somebody accountable if Pete said, hey, I'm going to get another tattoo and I'm going to get a big red devil right on my arm and I'm going to put under it born to be wild. (laughs) You might give him some good counsel. You might say it's time to call the elder of the church (laughs) and a couple board members. (laughs) Uh, But it's not... You don't, and I shared it this morning, you don't know the story of his tattoo. I don't want our young people or somebody else in this congregation going, my youth, and I've seen, I, and I'm sure he has, I've seen this posted on Facebook. My pastor has, youth pastor has a tattoo. If I want to get a tattoo, I'm going to get a tattoo. I have no problem if they get a tattoo, but if they're doing it just because Pete has a tattoo, Maybe they need to stop and talk to Pastor Pete and say, hey, what's the story behind your tattoo? Why do you get that? What does that mean? And it may not be sin for them to do it, but they need to look at the motivations of the heart. And it's a good theology of the body that helps us do that. See, unless we have a good theology of the body, we won't have transformation, and transformation of the church is what ultimately will impact our culture. Unfortunately, this is the culture we live in, and I'm just giving you a small snippet because, you know, I grew up in the air. My, my pastor, <laughs> when I first started going to an Assemblies of God church, I feel so sorry for his, he had, he had four daughters like I, until recently had four daughters, now I have a son. Uh, but my pastor had the, a television in their house and they were only supposed to watch like Oral Roberts and Jimmy Swagger and stuff on the TV. And he came home and I think they were watching Gilligan's Island or something and he cut the cord to the television so that they couldn't watch TV. Um, so I grew up kind of in the area, era of television was bad. I actually heard a sermon that television was like the children being sacrificed to Baal in the Bible and passing through and being sacrificed to Moloch in the flames, you know. And uh, I'd hear sermons like that, and now you, I'm starting to hear it all social media. Pokemon Go, it's bad because somebody ran across the street and got hit by a car, and I'm like, it's not the app that's bad, folks. It's the person <laughs> that was operating it. Two guys fell off a cliff in San Diego near where my daughter used to live because they were playing Pokemon Go. It's like, if you're on the cliffs, you should look where you're going. <laughs> so I'm just doing a little bit. Of just, just in our media culture, here's what uh, New Philosophy magazine came out in, in the summer of 2016, this summer, and said they're concerned because the three pillars of Western education, and they're primarily looking at the British, uh, Great Britain, uh, Australia, and the United States, are sex, beer, and murder. They said our children spend more time watching television and on social media than they do at school, and this is having an impact on how they think and how their life is and what they think is important. The average 12-year-old, by the way, most of the kids would tell you when you think social media adults, you're thinking Facebook, and they're like, I am not on there anymore because my grandparents are on there now. (laughs) Everybody jumped on there. I'm over here at Snapchat and, and WhatsApp, and we're... People don't know what I'm doing, (laughs) you know. By the time the average 12-year-old has reached the age of 12, he's seen 8,000 murders on television. TV violence is a causal factor, they're saying, in real violence, and it's a public health problem. Now, I'm not saying don't watch TV, and I'm not saying, hey, I watch a good bang, bang, shoot 'em up show once in a while. What I'm saying is this is what they're in, uh, this is what they're, they're swimming in. This is what they're undated with. This is what is their environment, and the church needs to balance that. I mean, they need to live in the real world. We aren't saying to everybody, you know, women, go out and get your little white hats on now because you have to keep your head covered, and I don't want to hear any of you talk. We're not saying that. By the time they turn 18, they've witnessed 16,000 murders, 200,000 acts of violence, and 500,000 television commercials. And so new philosopher, 
philosophy magazine says this is serious, this is concerning because basically we have a shallow, consumeristic, violent, whether verbally or physically, culture. And I would contend fearful for those of us that lived pre-9-11 and our kids were born pre-9-11 and we see the kids that were born after 9-11 here in the United States, if you think about it, they've only known war. They've only known airport security, TSA. They've only known those things. And you can see the difference in their childhoods and then the challenges they have. Americans currently watch 250 billion hours of television annually. And yet the majority of Christians in America say they don't find Bible reading or attending church essential to their faith. There's that other view of the human body and human mind that garbage in, garbage out, that we're like a computer. And that's really not biblical either. But the illustration has some limited value that what we put in is what comes out, is the way we act. That there needs to be a transformation of mind, but there needs to be a transformation of body, of our action in the world. And there needs to be an action of the spirit interacting with our spirit. So the answer isn't a list of holiness rules. I'm going to tell you as soon as you get this holiness rules, we break them. My mom was, was uh, an unchurched kid, and, and, and uh, she was picked up uh, by my grandmother from the other side of the family. They knew each other since they were little kids, and my mom went to church, and the first time she went to church, she was a teenager, and she had painted her fingernails, and some women in an Assemblies of God church told her she was a whore because she was a painted scarlet woman. And it really impacted, even today, my mom's a believer, but it really impacted how she views, how she views the gospel, and she has this sense of condemnation that she lives with. And my mom said what she really didn't understand, though, is they were in church, and they didn't have the fingernail polish, but she'd see them in the grocery store through the week, and they were all decked out. See, that's not living your life in the body. That's a bunch of legalistic rules. It's a challenge to live our faith as God intended in our body and counterculturally. To say, we're not like everybody else. Our young people here that were up here today from the Atlanta School of Ministry, I saw some of them had tattoos. Ooh. They look like the kids around them in our culture. But what I'm hearing from them and seeing in the way they enact their body and the way they give the spoken word and the way they present themselves is we look like the culture, but we act totally different. There's something in our life that takes more importance. There's something in our life that's more prominent. Just to rewind, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Matthew Lee Anderson says it this way, our relationship with God is inextricable from the body. It's a book, Earthen Vessels. I think it was published in about 2011. If you ever get a chance to pick up a copy, read it. It's just good thinking for you. Consider this, our bodies matter. How we live in them is an essential part of our faith. And the question I want to leave you with is how are you living in your body within the world? How are you living in your body within the world? Romans tells us, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. I would contend that if you're a believer today, however your body is, whatever's on your body, however many piercings you have, I, I sat through a sermon from a very famous evangelist one time, and it was like, I make all the kids remove their piercings before I'll pray for them because that delivers them from the demons that cause them to get pierced, <laughs> you know. I, it, it's not, don't, that's bad theology. <laughs> uh, but however it is, you present it to God, and you say, now, God, now what? 
an hour. And if you do that, verse 2 tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So here's the command of God. You've presented your bodies as a living sacrifice, so God says now you have to determine what's the pattern of this world, and I don't want you to conform to it, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is much more than reading the Scripture and just saying I'm reading the Scripture and I'm going to renew my mind. I know people that read the Scripture daily, and I look at them and think you don't have a renewed mind because what you need to be doing is taking that Scripture, applying it to your life, living it out in the body, and living it out in faith, and then you have proven that you have a renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, you can't separate the parts. When I'm talking about the body, I'm talking about the holistic being that we are. That we are, and, and there's two different views in the church and theology that we're body, soul, which is the mind, the emotion, the will, and spirit. It tends to be the one I believe, but there's good arguments for the idea of body, soul, spirit. Uh, regardless of which view, when you start to try to cut them and say, I am spiritual here, and I'm flesh here, and I'm weak here, and so my mind can think on this here, you begin to fall into heresy. God wants it all. That's what they said today. When they're talking about the seed of your heart, the Atlanta School of Ministry, God wants it all. When you have him on the throne, when you have Jesus on the throne, it's how you live your life. It's how you think your thoughts. God wants it all. And I want to tell you, especially young people, habits of body and mind determine your life. There are people that come into my office today. There are youth in this church that my wife and I have taken aside and said, hey, if you do not change the way you're thinking and the direction of your life, we will see you in 10 years. You will be homeless and on the street. And I've had them look me right in the eye and say, no, that's never going to happen to me. And I've said, that's what everybody else has said. <laughs> and not that we're saying that, the wor that it's always going to happen, that worst case scenario, but we really are kind of trying to scare them straight. And we're saying, look, you're burning bridges left and right. And at some point, even your parents are going to say, look, this is tough love. You're out there. And I, I've told him, I've said, I see these people every day. You need to get it together. And I'm telling you this because I love you. Habits of mind and body determine our life. So our bodies are dying. But for believers, they're being transformed. I have a butterfly image up there throughout this PowerPoint presentation. Because remember the song, Bullfrogs and Butterflies, that my kids, when they were growing up, that was the, you got that on the cassette tape, and then we went to CDs and, uh, but it was a kid's song, and it was like they are both been born again. And it was the idea, you know, you, the, the, the butterfly is a little worm, little caterpillar. It gets in the chrysalis, and then it comes out transformed. We are in the chrysalis of life with Christ right now. In a sense, even though we're in the world, we're not of the world, even though the world is dead and there are a bunch of zombies walking around, we are dead in Christ and protected from that impact of, of, of that death, and we are going to rise again to new life. And so we're being transformed from the inside out. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that, and I'm not going to read it. I'm going to just let you look at it because I'm even going over longer than I did this morning. So, And, and a final consideration is found in Philippians 3.18. And I just want you to read the red. We'll transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. I want you to get that in your heart. I am not, now I may die before Christ returns, but one day I know, just like I can go up to Pastor Pete and say, Pastor Pete, how are you doing today? I can go up and say, Jesus, let's, let's, let's go get some of that fruit from that tree. <laughs> I want to sit down. I can go up to the Apostle Paul and say, man, your words changed my life. <laughs> Paul go, it wasn't my words. It was the Holy Spirit. I can go up to Peter and go, dude, what were you thinking? <laughs> there are times I'm not so sure where you were at in your head. He's like, well, I was being transformed. I, 
we're, we're, this is part of our existence. This is who we are. And so what God says is now you're part of the kingdom. The kingdom is all around you. Our people that came in today and said we're going to be members of this church. See, the body's bigger than just this physical thing. There's the local body. There's the universal body of Christ. And then there's the physical body of Christ that we will one day interact with. And so what God is saying to us through the scripture, folks, is your old life was gone, the life you now live. I, 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 and because of the sake of time, I didn't do it, but I was tempted when I was preparing the sermon. Uh, when I was at my church one day preaching, when I pastored, I got up and I basically told the story of this life And this person's life was a disaster. I mean, most of you, if I told you that story, would say this person's hopeless. He's headed for death. And I told the story. It was the story of my friend Art. And I said, and then on August 22nd, 1982, he died. Never, never again could he be a part of this world. And as I told the story, you know, I could see members of my congregation just weeping. Tragedy. This life is lost. And then I said, but on that day, by the way, folks, my middle name is Arthur. <laughs> on that day, he rose to new life in Christ Jesus. And I'm serious. If I told, you know, my wife knows it because she saw the transformation just as I was coming out of the world in fact, my wife, before we were even dating, before we even had a thought in our heart of marrying, God told her, it's, I'm the only person she's ever done this for, to fast and pray for three days for me that I'd be delivered. That even though I was a believer, I had some deliverance issues. And she did. And I'm like, that's because God knew you were going to be my wife. And, you know. <laughs> and he loved you, ladies, so he didn't want you to have the mess that you would have gotten. Our, li literally, our senior pastor, when we were going to get married, our senior pastor was also a psychologist. Matt Biller would probably relate to this, you know. He, he did a psychological profile. Literally, now, our senior pastor at the time was not where he should have been with the Lord, but literally took my wife aside and said, don't marry this guy. You guys are going to end up divorced. And then told me that, and then I was like, so what are you going to do? That mean you're not going to marry us? He goes, no, I'll marry you. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm like, hypocrite. <laughs> but I say all that to say, you got to grow up. You got to interact in this body the way Christ wants you to interact. You got to be thinking about these things, people. Let's pray. If you don't know the Lord and, and you say, man, I, the idea of my body giving it to Christ hasn't even crossed my mind, I want to give you the opportunity we always do. I look out. Everybody looks like people I know that I'm sure are, are saved, but we never know because the body is only the outward appearance. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to raise your hand. That's all. It'll, it, it won't go any further than that, just to raise your hand. Now, Christian... If your body has not been kind of a part of your thinking about how to live for God, I want you to raise your hand and just say, I want to live for Christ in this body the way he tells me to. And I don't know what he's going to command of you. And I want to tell you, it's not, it's not comparison to someone else. We all have liberty. Somebody else may have the liberty to do something that God says, for you, I don't want that. For you, I want that to be set aside. So don't look at somebody else's liberty and try to justify disobeying God. You made the commitment. God, 
I died with Jesus Christ. He gave himself for me. So this life, I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God. And I really want you to think about that. What does that mean for me? How do I respond? How do I interact with people? How do I take and eat things and drink things? How do I craft my body and shape my body? We should take care of our bodies, but we shouldn't worship our bodies. You might go out today and say, man, that pastor, uh, when, when, and I'm not a pastor anymore, but I'm in the kind of the pulpit position right now when he was preaching. He inspired me to go get a tattoo. <laughs> Don't do it because I inspired you. But if it really would be for Christ's glory, don't be condemned either. Somebody else, God may have said, I called you to keep your body ink free. Don't be visiting an ink master anytime soon. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for each and every person here today. For their sacrifice and honoring your sacrifice and giving themselves to you. I pray, Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit would invade our church, would transform our church. Lord, I know this morning as I spoke that you spoke a word to us, that I believe that as our pastor is laying aside his normal schedule, giving his body to you, Lord, that his mind is being changed, his physical being is being renewed, his spirit is being imparted with new vision, Lord. And you shared with us this morning, Lord, that in 10 years, we're going to look back at this church and it's going to be unbelievable what you've done in our body, that you'll have raised up ministers and missionaries and everyday folks, Lord, who are sharing the gospel and who are impacting their world, Lord, that Perhaps we could be one of the churches, Lord, that see our nation turn around and repent as we, your people, humble ourselves and pray and call on you and seek you. And, Lord, that, that sense of spirituality is not that we have just another prayer service, but we as the people of God, as we're walking through our day, Lord, are saying, God, what is your thought on this? God, what should we do in this situation? God, how will this glorify you the most? Our minds should be focused on you. Our spirits should be listening to your spirit. Our minds should be spending time in your word. Our hearts should have you seated on the throne. So, Lord, we're not condemning the activities of one another, but we're encouraging one another daily, Lord, to call upon the name of the Lord, to trust in the word of the Lord, to live in the light of your gospel, to let your life make our lives what it was always intended to be, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Thank you, Brother John. And let's, uh, let's give John a hand for bringing the word this morning and saying thank you to him. And I only squirmed a little bit. And uh, no, um, so I think there's an opportunity that, you know, all of us could take what Brother John said and hear his heart behind it that, you know, it's not, you know, this that God looks at. He, God looks at your heart. And, uh, you know, out of the overflow of your heart, you act. And uh, just this week, I want to challenge you all, and as John challenged us, to examine what's in your heart. And is any part of your life, you know, maybe out of the overflow, how you're living, how you're acting, doesn't line up with what you believe or what the Word says. And, and let God, you know, let the Holy Spirit, His job is to convict us and to show us those areas that we need to change and, and to let Him do His work. Um, humble yourselves. You know, God said if you were to humble yourself and uh, seek him, that he's going to change you and he's going to make you in the image of his son, which is what we're all striving for, isn't it? To look like his son, to act like his son, and to love what he loves, and that's our call on our lives. And so let's use our bodies for that purpose. And uh, so let's, uh, I'm just going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. I'm going to um, send you out, and I want you to enjoy your day, enjoy your families. 
um, enjoy whatever blessing God has given you and uh, have a great week, okay? But Lord, I, I pray for uh, just everybody in this room. I thank you that uh, you have brought us here today to hear this message, this word uh, today. And God, I pray that uh, your truth be uh, alive in our hearts, God, that our heart is to truly live for you and to do the things that please you, God. And you would help us in that, Father. And Lord, I pray a blessing over each and every person in this room, that you go before and behind them, all around them, that the hand of blessing be on their household, God, that you would provide for them, that you would speak to them, and you would be Lord over their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Um, give somebody a, a handshake, a high five.